Right, well here we are in Wimbledon at the SSBX London headquarters. This is the traditional uh, Catholic church that was uh, excommunicated about over 20 years ago by the main Roman Catholic church. And Bishop Williamson here is uh, known for the way he comments on a variety of interesting and important subjects in the modern world. And people felt he went, he went a bit too far recently with comments on what people call the Holocaust. And he's recently been fined by, dramatically fined, 10,000 euros by a German court. Well, we're here with a no-holds-barred no discussion with him. And let me point out that what other bishop has four volumes of his, uh, of his writings, his letters to his congregation published, lively, interesting kind of theology. He made outspoken comments in the wake of the 9-11 event and prior to the invasion of Iraq. Uh, so it's quite a, a moving testimony. And... Uh, uh, he, he tells it like it is what, what he sees as the word of God from a really quite traditional perspective, a traditional ca Catholic uh, point of view. Well, Bishop, it's a uh, privilege to be here at the SSBX uh, building in, in Wimbledon uh, talking to you now at this crucial time just after this uh, rather absurd German court case. Um, I've been reading the fourth volume of your uh, letters published yes. in America and... Uh, it seems to me that uh, you're a priest who tries to get his congregation to uh, think over the issues rather than just believe them. I, I like the way you, 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 you unfold uh, what is true and what is reasonable. And I just quote a bit from you. You say, What will it take to give back to words their meaning, to enable heads once more to think, to re-establish the truth? And this is very much in the context of the main Roman Catholic Church having accepted uh, a, a, a Vatican II system which you feel is cannot ever really make sense mm. and has in some degree betrayed the Catholic Church. Yes. People don't think much now. The truth is at a discount. People's heads are very much turned to mush. Few people believe in the truth, believe that there is a truth, and if they believe that there is a truth, many, many, those who believe there is a truth believe you can't get at it. Mm. I've got three very intelligent and very serious colleagues who in the dispute of a year ago said the truth can't be got at, you know, that you're, nobody is certain of historical truth. Well, that's, the, you know, that's, that's, that's a despairing, I think it's false, I think the truth can be got at. I think in, in most, in many domains, in many respects, in many questions, if you look for the truth, you'll find it. But you've got to believe in it, and you've got to believe it's important, and you've got to use your mind, and not your feelings. Yes, it seems to me that um, maybe the church hasn't taken seriously enough the words in the eighth chapter of the fourth gospel from Jesus, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It seems to me that they, perhaps this was just merely a question of believing certain aspects of, of doctrine, Whereas it seems to me that that is a totally open statement about, about the world. And it's also connected with the idea of the, 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 the logos in the fourth gospel, which is the principle of rational intelligence in the world. That by using our minds, we've got to find that truth. And it seems to me that controversial remarks you've made about politics are trying to show this to people. Uh, there is... God exists... Uh, God is love, but he is also mind. Uh, the, the thing, no, he and his love and his mind are not three different things. They're one, one and the same. Um, he is mind, and therefore behind the whole universe there is the divine mind. And therefore, as you say, there is a principle of order and intelligence behind everything that we run into. Even the evil is allowed by God. God does not want evil, but he wants to allow evil because he can bring greater good out of it. Therefore, even the things that seem to contradict the existence of God don't, in fact, contradict the order that there is in the universe. And this order, can, as you say, as you suggest, can be discovered. And to discover the order that there is, is liberty. Because if a Boeing jet obeys the laws of reality, it's free to cross the Atlantic Ocean. But if, it, if the jet takes into its head not to obey the laws of reality, it, 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 like the f poor French jet that took off from, from Rio de Janeiro, something or other it didn't obey, it crashed into the ocean. 
to to be free to do anything to achieve anything you've got to follow the rules mm -hmm. and if you don't follow the rules you're going to see you're not going to start mm -hmm. I wonder whether uh, in that same chapter Jesus talked about the father of lies and a bit mysterious quite how this worked he was talking to the Pharisees yes and it seems to me some of the uh, we live in an era of massive untruth is given to us by the political system. Yes. And it seems to me that some of the comments you've made, especially when you're in America, just in the wake of 9-11, uh, that maybe we need to try and fathom a bit more what, what Jesus might have meant by this power and how it works in the world. If people honoured our Lord or believed in our Lord, they might take more seriously that Satan is the father of lies and they might be more interested in the truth, they might more love the truth, and they might understand better that the world is almost fabricated of lies. It's a tissue of lies, the modern world, because the modern world is being constructed against God and without God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's put itself under Satan, and therefore it's given itself over to the father of lies, and therefore it's full of lies. There are lies everywhere. Lies not only in politics, but in all, in all domains. The lies always f the li a lie is always a parasite on a truth so it's not as if there's no truth at all still there because if all truth disappeared the lies would have nothing to float on the lies always to some extent imitate the truth the more successful the lie the better it imitates the truth mm -hmm. but people don't people think they have got a comfortable life as it is and they want the comfort and the Satan will give them the comfort and therefore they'll go with his lies. So they've got a comfortable material existence and until they are shaken out of the material comfort, they pr they're not going to question the system of lies which has given them this comfort. Mm. There's a saying that by, by Jesus about, uh, about thought, okay, the, uh, the, and I said, as a man thinketh with his heart, so is he. And, uh, and, uh, it seems to me that maybe in, in some in these volumes you're trying to show us about th thinking with, with 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 the heart uh, in a way that we, we care for that community that that, uh, that we live in. Hmm. Well, uh, people's thinking today is is way off the truth, and therefore their lives are, as Americans would say, way off base. Um, the, the, li people's lives are in accordance with lies because they don't want the truth because they want to live free of any laws of God free of any commandments of God they want to enjoy themselves as it seems in this short life and therefore they want they, 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 turning their backs on the truth they expose themselves to building and living in a world of lies. Mm. Seems to me that uh, people, those of us here, particularly involved in what calls itself, perhaps over ambitiously, that the truth movement, yes. and it wants to look behind events of recent history, such as the 9-11 yes. terror attack on, on the towers, and the idea that there's a hidden history, a hidden agenda unfolding. And, uh, uh, but you hear engineers for 9-11 truth, but you don't really hear, say, Christians for 9-11 truth. It's as if they don't feel they've got a special moral duty. And I, I sometimes wonder what Jesus alluded to as the wisdom of the serpent, okay? There's a um, his saying in which um, oh, the light's got four, four animals in it, right? He said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, mm -hmm. and therefore be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now that's quite a difficult command that is given to his disciples. Uh, do you think it's sort of relevant today? Um, there are two, there, surely there are two different commands. Um, Be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves is a way of uh, saying that you're going to have to understand the wicked world but you mustn't in any way join in its manner of acting or thinking. That's, so you've got to be as wise as serpents. You've got to see what the enemy is up to uh, and therefore understand what's going on and understand just how far off base modern politics are and why they're so far off base because they're without God. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be as innocent as doves. You mustn't, through getting too close to all the evil, 
start taking part in it. You've got to st keep keep. Well, you've got to go close enough to know it, but stay far enough in order not to get infected. Mm -hmm. The other saying is, "I'll send you out as sheep amongst wolves." It is similar. It's true. It's similar, but uh, what it means is that the the the, the world is bad, it's going to be against you, as our Lord said, the world is going to be against you. It's been against me, as it's been against me, it will be against you, he says to his apostles at the Last Supper. Uh, and then, so, but they, they must not adopt the, the methods of the enemy to fight the enemy, because that's going to defeat the purpose of the exercise. If the sheep start behaving like wolves, then the wolves are going to have no idea of how they should behave with charity uh, for their fellow human beings. If the wolves see the sheep behaving like wolves, the wolves are going to think that being wolvish is perfectly all right. It, it isn't. That, so they're both of them prescriptions. Uh, the four animals come down to rules for how Christians should behave in uh, a naughty world, what relations they should maintain with a naughty world, mm -hmm. which is under the power of Satan. Mm. I feel these pastoral letters have a happy tone to them, as if your congregation appreciated getting these letters um, uh, and uh, being told of, of a true way of practising the Roman Catholic faith. But I wonder whether you, uh, whether they appreciated what you said about the wider political context, which one might possibly review as for the uh, enslavement and ruin of the human race, such as the fabrication of the 9-11 event. And I'd like, if I may, to read out but I think it's a terribly important part of your letter. And this is just weeks after 9-11, okay? October the 1st, 2001. And you give here a chronology of what we'd call false flag terror. That is, fabricated terror, whereby America in particular precipitates war because it wants it and then blames someone else. Something that the Brits are especially good at, okay? Uh, you say, uh, uh, on political level, we can be virtually certain that the media will not tell us the full story of 9-11, okay? There is serious reason to believe that in 1898 it was not the Spaniards who sank the USS Maine. That in 1917 it was not the Germans who set up the Lusitania as a target. That in 1941 it was not the Japanese who set up Pearl Harbor for attack. That in 1963 it was not Lee Harvey Oswald who killed President Kennedy. In 1990 it was certainly not Saddam Hussein who promised not to react if he, inv if he invaded Kuwait. In 1994 it was certainly not Timothy McVeigh's van exploding outside the Alfred Murrah building in Oklahoma City, which brought the front of the building down. And in 2001, who knows? Saddam Hussein, Milosevic, and now Osama bin Laden, from CIA assets to personal enemies of the American people. How many more times will the trick work? Now, I think that is a searing insight in which everything you said there is the truth, and uh, it seems to me that the American people were very lucky and fortunate to have someone telling them this, a mere weeks after 9-11. Now, I want to ask you, Bishop, did they appreciate that? A few, yes, but many, no. Um, because in, it's a particular problem of Great Britain and the United States that the Protestant uh, patriotism, or oh, the patriotism is lined up with Protestantism. And therefore, the patriotism is off base. Uh, for a Catholic, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a clear reason why it's off base. Uh, Henry VIII was, did a terrible damage to England. Um, and uh, I have an American friend who I want, who's a good historian. I asked him once, who is the most important person in American history? The one most important person in American history. And he said Henry VIII, just like, straight up like that meaning that the Protestant element has been decisive, the Protestant Anglo element has been decisive in American history, and I think he's right. Um, <coughs> if Protestantism is off base, then the whole, the whole of a society, the whole of these two great nations, sort of built, almost built around Protestantism, are going to have a false patriotism. Uh, for instance, <coughs> at the time of Henry VIII, it's very clear that uh, he killed St. John Fish and St. Thomas More. Um, St. Thomas More said, I die God's, uh, the king's good servant, but God's servant first. In other words, Thomas More was dying because he put God in front of his king. 
the rest of the great men in England at that time uh, put the king in front of God and therefore um, the king and country they put country in front of God and when you put country in front of God you've got a false patriotism yeah but this isn't just patriotism you're looking at it's a country that wants to start wars this is the terrible reality and, and can present a counterfeit agenda so the ordinary people think that it's someone else's starting. Yes. This is a weird mechanism, yes. which uh, might be a matter of our human survival for us to understand. And uh, I, I admire your work because you're, you're trying to point this out to people. Uh, I, I, and uh, you, you, there are other references welcome. in your letters where you talk about the towers being d dynamited in 9-11. In, uh, That's terribly important for congregations. The SSPX can appreciate that the towers didn't fall because planes hit them, but they fell because, as you said, they were dynamited. And as you quote from my quote from you again, politically behind the Arab terrorists are most likely to be would be architects of the new world order. They've been long been using the United you know, States as an instrument to achieve their control of the world. And uh, uh, I, I think that's um, I, I wonder whether the congregations uh, appreciated that. Generally, I don't think so. Uh, is there a paradox here that the SSBX is, is traditional and that can be in some way backward looking uh, and, and they think that that can be sort of enough to, um, that that's all they need to bother with? The problem is, ever since Henry VIII, that um, patriotism and religion in Anglo countries or politics and religion in Anglo countries have, have got, followed two different paths. Um, the, the religion in England became false I speak exactly as a Catholic. Um, the, the religion in England became false from Henry VIII onwards, and the, the official religion in England has been false ever since, the Anglican religion. Uh, and the politics have been false as well, because they've been the, the leading citizens who take part in politics, including the king from the kings downwards, have been cut off from the true religion. They were being cut off from the truth. And therefore, in these countries, and now it's almost all over the world, uh, an organization, an untruthful, a truthless organization has uh, taken over the power. Uh, instruments of Satan. Um, it's, one is not allowed to mention uh, who these people are. Uh, for obvious reasons, because they hold the power and they don't like being uh, d denounced out in public. Well, if I may just quote fr from, from these excellent uh, letters of yours, um, uh, I talk about the ar attitude towards the Arabs. And can America have a fair attitude to towards the Arab countries? But each time the United States attempts to act even handily towards the Arabs, Jewish power inside the United States, e.g. virtual control of finance and the media, blocks the attempt and the United States returns to oppressing the Arabs. Uh, well, and I've mentioned it uh, in, I mentioned uh, that it's not only the Jews, and it's, you, could, you could say it's not even principally the Jews. It's, it's a very big problem. Um, if we go back to the passion of our Lord, uh, the Judas Iscariot was worse than Annas and Caiaphas. Annas, Annas and Caiaphas was the obvious and open enemies of our Lord, the high priests. But the one who betrayed our Lord to the high priests, who, and the one who made it possible for the high priests to get hold of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, was the apostle, the false apostle, Judas Iscariot. Therefore, the enemies of God inside the Catholic Church are the worst of all. Um, and the, uh, those who are enemies outside the Church, like, let's say, the Jews or the Freemasons or the Communists, there are, you know, the various categories of these enemies outside the church. Um, they are not the worst. If there weren't enemies inside the church, if there weren't betrayers of our Lord inside the church, the church would be much, would be a much stronger position, much stronger position to lead, to to lead the politics, to lead the arts, to lead the world. Mm. Um, when you were asked to leave uh, America in 2003, after you'd been there for 21 years. Uh, went to, you went to Argentina. Yes. Uh, was that anything to do? Did you feel it had anything to do with you having spoken out about 9-11? Um, I don't know, but I, think it's, I honestly think it's quite possible. 
because it's, it's perfectly possible because a number of good Americans, um, patriotic Americans, who may not have liked what I was saying in, in those, these passages that you're quoting, I say a lot of other things besides, but you're quoting these, these, these needle passages, uh, a, a, a number of American citizens will not have been happy patriotic citizens, and they may well have complained to my superior without my knowing anything about it. Not many complained to me directly because they may have felt that it was useless, but they may well have complained to my superior. Um, and he may have well have taken into account what they were saying. I don't. I honestly don't know. Perhaps we could fast forward to uh, what's happening here. Last year, the SSPX tried to buy a church in Manchester, a disused, empty church. Yes. And he got told by a Jewish spokesperson uh, who was opposing the sale of this building yes. said, quote, the Jewish community could not be at peace or live without fear so long as this society of St. Pius, Pius X remained in this country. Yes. That was August last year and he made it clear that there was nothing to do with anything controversial that you had said. Yes. This was simply to do with the doctrinal position of the SSPX. That's correct. In other words, um, the Jewish people feel always that their great enemy is the Catholic Church. I think that's a true statement. Um, and the, the Jews are smarter than many Catholics. And therefore, it, the Jews see that traditional Catholicism is the real Catholicism. Whereas many Catholics think that the Vatican too, that what we'll call the Council or Conciliar Catholicism, is the real Catholicism. But I don't think that the Jews are afraid of Conciliar Catholicism like they're afraid of traditional Catholicism. Between traditional Catholicism and the Jews, or certain Jews, there's been enmity from the crucifixion onwards. There's been enmity for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Because the Jews then felt that our Lord was taking away their privileges, which in a certain sense is true. Uh, before our Lord, the Jews were the people of God, the unique and, and special people of God. Mm -hmm. From our Lord onwards, the, 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 all people who believed and accepted our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and j joined his church were the people of God. So th there was no... Before our Lord, the Jews had an ex exclusive privileges as the people of God. After our Lord, those privileges were, were wide open to anybody, not by belonging to the race of the Jews, but by, by, by faith and, and acceptance of our Lord's great offer of heaven. As long as we behave ourselves in this life, we'll be given heaven in the next. That's what our Lord is offering, thanks to his cross and his suffering, by which he defeated Satan. Um, but the Jews saw it, and I think they still see it, as a, a, the Catholic Church, the true Catholic Church, as the cause of their loss of privilege and loss of status and loss of leadership, if you like, loss of being number one. And therefore, um, they are always against, they've always been against, or a number of Jews have always been against, some, yeah, many you know, leading Jews. There are hundreds of time, at times more Jews in this country than there are SSPX members. And um, the idea that Jews would not be able to live without fear or not be able to live in peace, as long as the SSPX, is, 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 is totally beyond the limit of absurdity. I mean, there must be another motive uh, other than their wanting to live in I, peace I, for wanting to stamp out your church and prevent them, successfully prevent you from getting that church in Manchester. I'm afraid they are intelligent. Um, there's a Latin saying, ab inimico dishi, learn from your enemy. Uh, the Jews have made themselves choose to be enemies of the unchanging Catholic Church, the traditional Catholic Church. That's their choice. Um, God gives them freedom and freely they choose to fight against the, the, the true Catholic Church. They know that it's not a question of numbers, it's a question of truth. And truth does, uh, does have a way of prevailing. Truth does have a power of its own. And if there's even just a small group of people who are upholding a truth which undermines their privileges, then they recognize that and they will fight it as best they can and they fought it successfully in Manchester insofar as they stopped us getting that little church. Hmm. Yes. Um, 
Uh, uh, okay. Um, I think some of your words here need to be re remembered. And uh, what, what you said about the... I'm well, talking about Pearl Harbor and the Twin Towers. You say here, Pearl Harbor and Twin Towers are classic examples of how modern democracies must be led with lies. Now, it seems to me that Christians should follow what you, your example, what you're saying, of having some 9-11 truth movement. Christians should be urgently concerned with the New World Order fabricated events uh, and try to appreciate what Jesus said about the father of lies in this context. And if they don't, they're not fulfilling those words about finding out what is true. The best of Christians are concerned first and foremost with the glory of God and with the salvation of their souls. And in order to save their own souls, the, the, the Christians who believe what the church teaches know that at death it's not an end, it's just a beginning. It's the beginning of eternal life. And eternal life is going to be either in heaven or in hell. Heaven is unimaginably blissful, hell is unimaginably painful. Um, and that's, and eternal life goes on forever and ever and ever. This life goes on at the most for 70 years. Therefore, anybody who understands what the church is teaching believes that the next life is far more important than this life. That what is important about this life is how it prepares you for the next life. Is Because the whole of the next life, the whole of our eternity, the whole of eternity of each of us depends upon this tiny little life. This tiny little life is tiny. 70 years, 50 years, 30 years, 90 years. It's tiny. It goes by like a breath of wind. But on it depends the whole of eternity. And therefore, that's what's important about this life, how we prepare for eternity. And whether we're going to die at that moment of death, whether we're going to be an enemy or a friend of God, that's what matters. Now, when Christians say to themselves, when they have that perspective, politics is not so important. Politics takes second place. Now, I personally agree with you. I, th I too think that uh, it's very important to understand the pressure that satanic politics or politics led by the father of lies can exert upon Christians and how it can bend their thinking and how it can, turn, it can, it can distort their view of the great truths like death, judgment, hell and heaven, known as the four last things. I believe that these false politics uh, do crash into uh, death, judgment, heaven and hell. Mm. But if I, if I thought, like I think many Christians do think, that uh, politics don't crash into religion, that, that the politics and religion are alike, I'm not saying that, I'm not accusing them of completely separating the two, but if, if, if Christians think that politics are not so important, well, of course, then they're not going to worry about who's in charge, uh, what errors well, there are, what there lies is, there is are. There's a certain du duality with Jesus answering about the coin and rent to God which is God's and Caesar and that which is Caesar's. Uh, and perhaps that's a bit sort of convenient for uh, keeping out of politics. That, you're very right. That, that quotation, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's, that quotation is often used in order to help split <coughs> religion from politics. But what our, what our Lord is saying is the two are distinct, mm -hmm. but they're not separate. So you mustn't blur them. On the other hand, you mustn't split them. Mm -hmm. They're distinct, but not separate. They're distinct. You mustn't blame, but they're, they're not separate. Well, the, the two flow into one another. Right. Let's put it this way. People are nowadays made to live in fear. We're always given fear by our government of, of yes. terror, terror events, things we've got to fright, be frightened of. I mean, this country hasn't really got an enemy, okay? If we want to be happy, we could actually live without having an enemy. And the politicians are continually giving us enemies that we have to fear and we have to fight. And... Uh, that enables the politician to manipulate us, as the BBC trilogy called The Power of Nightmares, that utterly worthless entities can become politicians uh, as long as they know this rather diabolical technique of how to manipulate people through their fears. And uh, it seems to me that if Christianity is to have any important relevance today, it's got to be able to challenge that uh, and, and say that uh, the politicians are, are always getting from what's called intelligence, British military intelligence, uh, fears and uh, or mainly often faked, faked events or events blamed on the wrong person uh, so that they can 
manipulate the fears of all of us, really. And uh, it seems to me that with this sun fairly sunny optimism of these letters of yours, you have attempted to challenge this. Um, I, yes. Where's, as you pick out these extracts, I can see why I was thrown out of the United States or pushed, moved on from the United States, because these quotes, you know, they go against the many many people's even catholic catholic people's idea of the separation of church and state i i think that if the politics are all false like you're saying the use of fear to manipulate people and so on and so on if there's a creation of false enemies i think that's true uh, to a to a considerable extent um I, I think that this corruption of truth in the realm of politics ends up by corrupting truth, the sense of truth in the realm of religion. And, and that's why I've been, in those letters, I've been, you know, talking about it and uh, why I've always gone for this. Uh, but whereas, as you quote all these passages, I can see that, you know, it's not popular. Well, I, I, it's I, not I, don't, I, don't, I don't see why. I mean... You, you're get, getting some of this on the eve of the terrible war that America was being dragged into, Iraq, and you were talking about the Christian conditions for a just war and how yes. it was not in any way met. And you're talking about fabricated intelligence that was used as a pretext for, for war. Yes. I, I think it should have been terribly important for more of a Christian movement. I mean, in America, you get the demented Christian movement, which sees Jews coming back to Israel as the fulfillment of, of God's plan. Uh, and, and the aspiration towards a greater Israel as forcing God's hand and making the apocalypse come true uh, and this extremely mad uh, sort of what you might call right-wing Christianity that we hear tens of millions of people tune into in, 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 in America. Yes. Uh, maybe, uh, and this, this is a, a, a Christianity that wants war because it sees it as fulfilling prophecy uh, and it, it's, it's, there's a dreadful madness in that. Uh, there is a madness, uh, in the, in the, in the, the main madness is Protestantism, uh, forgive me, but that's the truth of the matter, um, I'm sure. Uh, the American Protestants are very vulnerable to uh, mendacious propaganda, to lying propaganda, because they've lost the, the, the truth of the Catholic Church. Uh, the best Protestants are decent men who do believe in the Bible and do accept the Bible, but they don't have the wisdom of the church to interpret the Bible for them. But what about the prophecy about, alleged prophecy about Jews having to come back to Israel again to fulfill the uh, last times? Uh, someone who read the Bible told me that wasn't actually there. Uh, would you like to comment uh, on that? Is that I'm too much of a hot potato? No, no, no. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know scripture well enough to be sure of, but I think it's our Lord who says that the, I think it's our Lord himself who says, he's coming back to me, that the, the Jew, that, that after he's crucified, Jerusalem will be severely punished mm -hmm. and the Jews will be scattered, which of course happened. They were scattered all over the world. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they sowed salt. The, the Jews tried to come back after a while and the Romans again just chased them out and, and they were scattered all over. Only in, you know, in, with the foundation of the State of Israel in modern times have the Jews come back. Uh, it's, I don't know where, how the, the whole thing plays out between now and the end of the world. I don't know. But it's possible that the Jews are going to stay in Israel until the end of the world. It's possible. Um, is therefore this present state of Israel the fulfillment of prophecy? Uh, I'm in one way yes, in another way no. It's certainly not. The, this state of Israel is is not Catholic in any way at all. It's it's it fights against Catholicism. It's uh, the the present Israeli state is very hard on Christians, although there are conversions amongst the Jews, but they, we never hear about them. Um, the vibrations of our Lord are still there in the Holy Land. But I don't think that this state of Israel is... A th the, the, the pious Jews themselves, the Hasidic Jews, accuse the present state of Israel of being godless and atheistic. The, the Hasidic Jews say that this, this Israeli state is not God's wish. 
It's not, God's, it's not the fulfillment of God's plan. But over in the United States, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Protestants are made to believe that uh, it is the fulfillment of prophecy and therefore the Protestants must all get behind the state of Israel and must support it financially and must support it morally. And that, of course, happens to a huge extent. But that's because the poor American Protestants are, are, are short on truth and they don't have the wisdom of the Catholic Church to interpret Scripture correctly and tell them what God really meant by these passages. Okay. Now, Bishop, I, I, I'd like, if I may, to move on a subject which may be a bit uh, p p painful, which led to this, um, you, your, your short video of you being flashed all around the world last year. Yes. Uh, is that okay if, if I just bring it up, or it's not, won't be too distressing for you, will it? Uh, no, 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 dis no distressing right. for me, no. no. Uh, it might be distressing for my superiors. I just have to be careful um, what I say for my superiors. Uh, okay, well, uh, I think a lot of us were really impressed by the diamond clear words of truth you spoke on the subject of what people call the, the, the Holocaust. And it was a short five-minute conclusion of an hour-long interview in which, apparently, quite spontaneously, uh, you, you, you made some comments. And next thing we knew, you were being thrown out of Argentina and uh, the Pope was demanding that you recant. And uh, a lot of us were totally awestruck at the way you uh, refused to do so. <laughs> and uh, you said you'd always been guided by a search for that which is true, and that is what brought you into the Catholic Church. I think it's, yes. And, and uh, you would therefore look further into, um, and I think you said you got to book my Pressac about Auschwitz. And uh, I think... Uh, a, a, a lot of people, you may not, may not have seen like that from the media response, were, were rather awestruck by this way in which you said you, you spoke what you believe was true. Well, I, I, I certainly spoke what I believed at that moment to be true, yes. Mm. And um, I... Um, have I yet recanted... Uh, I, I don't think so. No, right. Well, glad to hear it. Um, so... If, if I may comment on a number you quoted, between 200 and 300,000 yes. total deaths, now I think you might have said Jewish deaths, within the German labour camps. Uh, well, I just, I just under like, the Third Reich, yes. Under the Third Reich, yeah. I just like to point out, this, this comes from the Bad Aronson archives. I think it's terribly important for us to appreciate that in North Germany there's a huge archive of all records of World War II labour camp victims which have been consulted 50 years for all Holocaust claims and uh, that has, really important question is that has a total number of, um, of, of deaths registered. Yes. And, and that is, that totally gives us the figure between two and three hundred thousand yes. which you quoted yes. uh, and I think uh, a lot of people uh, don't realise that that is where the number came from. And also, may I point out that you have not made a statement challenging the six million figure. That is what German law prescribes, and you're being somewhere quoted as saying that. That's a total number of Jews who died in World War II, and you have not commented on that. You've only commented on the deaths in the labour camps. Yes. Well, I don't know. I, I, think, I think it was the, the total number of deaths. I, I still think, that's my opinion, still is the total number of deaths under the Third Reich, the total number of deaths of Jews under the Third Reich. Well, it's, it's in, as recorded in the, in the Labour camp. Well, that was what your statement was about. Is that it? Was that it? I, I honestly yeah. can't remember, but then it may be only the, in the Labour camps. But in any case, um, I'm, nothing that I've seen since has yet persuaded me differently, let's just say. It seems to me that the total number, which is the most holy and sacred icon in our modern civilization. That is the figure of six million, which I wouldn't advise anybody to challenge, like it's in Wikipedia and just leave it there. That number is not easily verifiable. Uh, it pertains no. to the total number of Jews who moved in and out of various different European countries uh, and various different totals which are added up and mm. who went to Russia, who went to America. Uh, I wouldn't advise anybody to try and have an opinion on that figure or to dispute the six million. Yes, well, it's, uh, boy, is it controversial. Oh, wow. It's, uh, it, if, the, if there's any hot potato, that's it. Well, uh, if the German court is objecting to, you, to your number, which it did, of two to three hundred thousand, mm -hmm. my suggestion would be that you write a letter to them and say, point out to them, that that figure simply comes from the bad Arlson total, 
and they write to the manager of the bad arson and uh, request for an estimate of that total. And before doing so, they would have to specifically tell, specifically set up a condition whereby the manager would not be put in jail and his institution would not be closed down for revealing that figure. Because obviously in Germany, uh, if you come out with these figures, you are put in jail for, just for that. Uh, you're dreaming. I'm afraid you're dreaming. Uh, there's a, a whole world order is being built upon the s coming out of the Second World War is being built upon this reading of the Second World War and if you finger this particular topic you're, you're threatening the whole new world order. Well tell me about it Bishop. Uh, <laughs> I mean I was a, quite, a nice quite academic post until I got involved in all this. Um, but my favourite bit at Auschwitz, I, I perhaps unwisely made some comment about there being a swimming pool there yes. around the back of the main it's base true. camp. And you can still see it on Google yes, Earth, okay? That's right. And um, people got the screaming heebie jeebies about me saying there was a swimming pool there. And uh, my favourite thing, I think, is a notice in Hebrew at the side of that swimming pool, and it says, This is not a swimming pool. And <laughs> I think that's the, the essence of the process of conjuration that is going on. The, I didn't know about that. But it doesn't surprise me. I, the, the inmates themselves built the pool. Yeah. And they built it well because it still holds water. Yes. So uh, there was also a theatre, there was all kinds of facilities. Mm -hmm. It was a work camp. It's, it's work clear. Camp, yeah. it's, you know, it wasn't an extermination I, camp. I, I know there are huge uh, industrial plants right next to Auschwitz. You uh, see, the, the Buna rubber that come, they went off to every day. Come, come back to religion. The problem is that the, the, the Holocaust is a religion. It's, it is, it's, yeah. it's serving the function of a religion. Totally, yeah, totally. That, that Auschwitz is replacing Calvary. Yeah, totally. This, totally, is, yeah. this is the problem. This is the central issue for, for And so, priests. you know, you're attacking people's religion. People don't have any... When they don't have any real religion, they're going to have a false religion. They've got to have some religion. As reminds what William Blake said, he said, man must and will have some religion. If he has not the religion of God, he will have the religion of Satan. Yeah, well, that's, I'm afraid that, that's it. The, the religion of God, there are four or five, it's the Catholic religion, the real Catholic religion, not the falsified Catholic religion, and uh, anything else is more or less satanic, and therefore Protestantism is, is at least in part satanic, Mohammedanism, I mean, you, you get in all kinds of trouble for saying these things, but that's why they were Catholic martyrs from the very beginning of the Catholic Church. You get killed if you say these things. Let's come back to this idea of the hollow, hollow hoax, or whatever you want to call it, being a, a ersatz religion today, uh, as, the, as the compulsory new civic religion that's pushing out the tired old religions of yesteryear. Yes. It seems to me that for any politician to get access to deep emotions and deep reverence, you just have to say those words, Holocaust and Auschwitz, uh, and you have that tremendously solemn uh, power over people. Yes. And, and the deep religious emotions, you, the concept yes. of atonement, of guilt, of never ending yes. guilt, yes. of the Jews as God's co chosen people, yeah. uh, uh, and of uh, uh, sort of ultimate religious things are, are given to this story. Yes, uh, the innocent victim is the Jewish people. The redeemer is the six million who died. Mm. The uh, sacrificial victim is the six million who died. Uh, the Mount Calvary is the concentration camp of Auschwitz. It's incredible, but you've got... And is, is Eli Wiesel, the high priest of the... Uh, uh, as it were, and he's now being <laughs> shown up to be a, 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 a hoax. Shown up to be the greatest liar ever lived. The, the, there's no, there's no tattoo on his arm. There's no <laughs> concentration camp tattoo on his arm, apparently. You know, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. But, but uh, on the other hand, it's totally believable. G.K. Chesterton said that when, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. And the Jews have this ability to, they have this sense of religion. Mm -hmm. Because for 2,000 years, from Abraham through to our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. our Lord, or the, the Lord God, took them apart and, and gave them very special treatment. He punished them when they were naughty and he rewarded them when they were good. Mm. They were his people. They were to prepare, they were to be the cradle of the Messiah and when the Messiah at last came they were his cradle. And there were some marvelous, marvelous people like the Mother of God, like St. Joseph, like the Apostles, 
who uh, surrounded our Lord and enabled him to launch the true religion, of, of the true and everlasting religion, the, eternal, the, eternal, the new and eternal testament, which is um, Catholicism. But uh, if that religion goes, then something else has got to take its place. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Jews, for 2,000 years, they, they had the Lord God in their bloodstream, in a manner of speaking. It, it, then pride, when, the Messiah, when their Messiah finally came, mm -hmm. pride took over and they refused him. Mm -hmm. But they still had that training in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And therefore ever since, they have had a special ability to create s a false substitutes for the true religion. Mm -hmm. And the last and perhaps supreme example of this is, is the Holocaust religion. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it is, it is, it, and it, if I may come back to the wonderful clear words you spoke on that video, you said, the evidence is overwhelmingly against the idea of mass human cyanide gas chambers. Okay? Yes. Now, I think it's terribly important to appreciate, I'm speaking more as a science historian, okay, but these mass human cyanide gas chambers have never ever existed on planet Earth. Nowhere, never. They are just a phantasmal nightmare. They are a nightmare hallucination brewed up at Nuremberg in 1946 mm. by British and American military intelligence. Mm. Okay? And made compulsory, as you point out, made compulsory for German to, Germany to believe. Mm. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, that total non-existence is... Uh, well, it's partly why, why the... <laughs> And the Holocaust has this transcendental meaning in our modern civilization, that there's no trace of any material documentary evidence for these chambers existing. Yeah. That, that they're, they're a kind of, uh, kind of spiritual, hallucinatory thing, yeah. which, uh, if you question it, you immediately become, oh, you're a Nazi. Oh, are you some kind of Nazi? Oh, God, you're so anti-Semitic. Yeah. And that's always the response. I mean, yeah, I've, I I've had this for a couple of years, and I suspect you've had it too. But people don't come up and ask you what you're talking about. I know. They don't want to discuss the subject. I know, I know. That's what's so amazing. Yes. I mean, I've always been used to having offbeat interests and strange uh, subjects that a few people want to talk to me about. Yeah. And when I came out on the basis of chemical investigation, the chemical evidence of saying uh, the Zyklon in the German labor camps went to ordinary, normal, hygienic mm -hmm. purposes, just as it was supposed to do, mm -hmm. um, people just aghast. And I yeah, get, I know. You get lambasted as an Nazi. Yeah. Uh, and it's as if people's minds just slam shut like a steel yeah, trap. That's right. That's so extraordinary. That's right. And that's the power of the lie. If, you know, it's the power of Satan. In the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord says, uh, this is your hour and the, the power of Satan. You know, this is the hour of darkness and the power of Satan. This is... And at, at the moment, at that moment, was a tremendous moment of Satan when the crucifixion, the putting to death of our Lord was being prepared by the high priests and then it was put into action and then the Romans were triggered to do it for the Jews. Um, that was a moment of Satan and I'm afraid that to, today in the world is a moment of Satan. Um, if we come back to these, uh, the, the, the wonderful phantasmal hallucination that, <coughs> that all good citizens in our society believe in with terrific deep power, these yes. mass human cyanide gas chambers, even though there's no pictures of them or nobody has an yes. image of them at all, uh, it seems to me, I just like to put this to you, that there's five different levels of, of non-existence. Firstly, there's no trace of any documentary evidence mm. in the Third Reich of any intention to mass exterminate. Mm. So if you want to believe that this mass coming of Jews went on, you have to believe that there's some sort of ESP process. They did it without <laughs> any documents. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, there's no trace of any bodies of the six million Jews gassed. Right. There's no pile of them, no remains of bones. They must have had magic wand to make them all vanish. Yep. Okay. Thirdly, there's not one single documentary record of death by cyanide poisoning in any German labour camp. Yep. The enormously extensive literature uh, remains kept, and people going through it, great detail. It's all about it's all about the Arlson archive, and not a single cyanide poisoning. Yep. Okay. Fourthly, no photograph anywhere at all of what would be the most bizarre, extraordinary scenes of the 20th century. You know, piles of bodies, maybe mixed mm. gender, shoveled out of these. No photos at all. Uh, and last but not least, if you go to the German labour camps now, the remains, there's nothing that credibly resembles a human gas chamber. Yeah. Okay? 
I except know. of course for the uh, post-war constructed one. That, uh, I know, but you're trip, you're yeah. up against a religious belief. You just said it yourself. It's deep and it's it's a steel trap. It's it's the only religion that many people have still got left. It's the only thing sacred. It's the it's the only sacred landmark remaining in in godless people's lives. Yeah, yeah. People need something sacred, and the only thing sacred left for many people today is the six million victims of Nazi horror. That's all that's left. That that is the ultimate evil, and therefore the Jews are good, therefore the Germans are no good, therefore America must tell, therefore, 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 and therefore we get the New World Order. It's, ve it's yeah, very... So, uh, as a priest, as a Christian priest, do you have a duty to challenge that? Uh, that which yes. is the most sacred and holy thing, the most sacred icon in our civilization. I mean, nowadays you can scoff at the resurrection, mock any sacred dogma, you can throw a holy book down the lavatory, uh, n nobody is really bothered. But if you challenge the Holocaust, people are deeply shocked, and suddenly half your friends aren't speaking to you anymore, uh, and you know that you're a heretic, uh, and, and you go through all this basically religious experience of being damned. Uh, I mean, is it really the business of a priest to uh, challenge this? Uh, let me answer. You <laughs> let me answer you with a counter question. Um, in the, let's say we're in about the year 100 or 150. In other words, under the Roman Empire, we're in Rome and you're a 15-year-old girl, one of the virgin martyrs, is it your business to go up and challenge the emperor? No, it isn't. If the emperor comes after you, then you've got to... Then what, what the Catholic Church teaches is this. If you're challenged in your faith, you've got to respond. But if you're not challenged, you don't have to say... that You don't have to declare the whole faith in all circumstances. In other words, um, you... you, you if somebody asks you d directly and point blank, is this true, is this true, is this true, that your faith says, you've got to answer yes, 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 if it is true. No, 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 if it's false. But if they don't question you, you're not obliged to say things which are going to drive them crazy well, or make them want not, to kill you. I'm not sure that's quite adequate, Bishop. I mean, you, of your own volition, came out and made this statement, which is enlightening for the whole of planet Earth, echoed around our world, everyone was talking about it, and, in a manner of speaking, it terminated your, 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 your career, or let's hope temporarily interrupted it. Uh, I, I mean, you must have chosen to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, I, of course I chose at, the, at that moment to talk about it. And, you know, people say, they watch me sort of sitting back and thinking as though I'm wondering whether, as though, you know, I look as though, am I going to ask this question or not? And I'm sure that that was, but, but okay, the reason I chose to but was because it seemed to me, a, it seemed to me an important question and it deserved a straight, it's, this question in itself is straight. In the circumstances it wasn't straight, in the circumstances it was a trap. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yeah. But in itself it's a straight question, which, and it's a very serious question. Yeah. Yeah. Is our modern world built upon a lie or is it not? It's a huge question. Yeah. It's a very important question. Yeah. So I just, I tried to give it a straight answer. That's all there is to it. Yeah, right. But I mean, the result was, you say, the termination, <laughs> the interim termination of my career, my being treated like a her heretic and everything else you mentioned. Well, okay. perhaps that's what our Lord meant by saying, take up thy cross and follow me. Well, maybe, but on the other hand, some people would say, I shouldn't have been dumb and stupid enough to to open my big mouth uh, in the first place. No, I think that was divine inspiration. That well, know. that's what you think. Yeah, that's what you think. But that's what a lot of people don't think that. A lot of people think that I was foolish to, to say that because of all the consequences that, that followed. A lot of unpleasant consequences that followed. For instance, in, in my religious congregation inside Germany, life became, I'm told, I believe, quite difficult for all our priests and for all our people in Germany because everybody said you're all of you neo-Nazis and they had to prove that they weren't Nazis. They had to prove because they're tied to me. I've tied, I've tied, it, it seems as though I've tied the society to the Holocaust. To well the I think the word Nazi nowadays just means someone who understands the chemical evidence for how the Zyklon gas chambers worked. As far as I can tell that's the, the modern way it's, it's been used. <laughs> um, what can you do? You if know. I may just comment further upon your your excellent five minutes. You commented on Fred Leuchter yes. and the importance of his survey. Yes. And I think that's important because everyone nowadays says, oh, it's discredited, oh, discredited. 
as if not that one word. Okay. Not at all. It was all. actually it's been confirmed That's right. by somebody else's survey, the brilliant yeah. German chemist uh, okay. German yeah, Rudolf. Rudolf yeah. uh, he, he, did a, he did much the same thing as Fred Leuchter. So you've got about 60 wall samples, for God's sake. 60. Yes. Uh, uh, measuring sound out in the walls. Yes. And I come in, a bit of a different angle from you, that the iron in the walls bonds permanently with the cyanide. That's right. This is unexpected, and it's a fact. Yeah. So six years later, all you've got to do to find out where the cyanide was used is take wall samples and measure total cyanide. That's right. And I put the two together. I'd like if I may just to give five numbers for any SS priests or anyone who wants to try and figure out what, what, what you are saying. Only, only, so three numbers which I think are terribly simple, okay? The level of cyanide in the delousing chambers, those are the, that was normal hygiene technology before DDT was developed in 1945, from about 1920 to 45, uh, and it was 10 cubic meter chambers in which the zyklon was warmed to give off the cyanide to penetrate and kill all the bugs. And once uh, typhus hit the camps in 1942, in that same year, these gas chambers were installed throughout all the German labour camps, okay? Yeah. Normal hygiene technology. Yeah. Now, in those walls, those walls are blue, and it's a lovely sight, uh, uh, blue walls, because they're totally saturated with iron cyanide still, yeah. and I think it's such a shame that they're out of bounds, and all these school kids who come to Auschwitz aren't allowed to see the actual gas chambers, you know, which, which <laughs> are the, the blue delousing chambers, blue walls. Okay, those have 5,000 parts per million yeah. cyanide in the walls. That's the overall average, about sure. 15 samples, okay? Yeah. Now, if you go to ordinary dormitories and kitchens, sample it, you get about two parts per million, yeah, yeah, okay? Yeah. Now, that is the level from a single fumigation cyanide, which they did just to kill off all bugs yeah, and cracks and so yeah, on, yeah. two. So the big question is, what is the level of what are alleged to be the human gas chambers? That's the big question, okay? Yeah, yeah. And the answer is the average there comes out at three parts per million. Yeah, yeah. Okay, three, which is very slightly different from the controlled background level, but it's not significant. Yeah, sure. There is no significant d difference of the samples taken so far from what are alleged to be the human yeah. gas chambers and the controlled background. Yeah, yeah. And they're both thousands of times less than the chambers where, where cyanide was actually used, yeah, day yeah. in, day out, hour yeah. after hour. Uh, so just those figures themselves are totally conclusive. Of course. More research is not yeah. needed. I, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's an open shut case. And what interests me, as a science historian, is that no science journal anywhere in the world can discuss this. No chemistry journal can discuss this. No history of science you're journal, as far as I know, can discuss even the zapton gas chambers as normal hygiene technology. You're up, you're up against a religion. Well, uh, is this a sort of science versus religion story? I'm uh, about? Yeah, and this time science is on the side of the truth, and the religion is false, and the science is true in this case. Yeah. Often it's the other way around, or m science is made to seem to be against religion. Yeah. And in this case, science is on the side of the truth. Yes, it's common sense. But what can you do? Did anyone in your order appreciate what, what you had said? A few priests. A few priests. Mm. A number of the laity, um, and a few priests. But otherwise, it's too hot. It's just too hot a potato. It's just too dangerous. But do they appreciate what you're saying about the Holocaust religion displacing the old religion? That's a good, another good question. Well, I thought they would just experience that in a fairly basic manner. The no, Jews, they... well, the traditional language of, of guilt, suffering, redemption is being taken over by um, Zionist Jews. I think that's... <laughs> I, I think you're right. I say to you, I've, I've just been saying to you, you know, that the, the Jews have the Lord God in their bloodstream and they have an instinct for creating these false religions. It's a terrible thing to say, but I'm afraid it's true. They do it by instinct. And they've, they've got a way of projecting these lies in such a way as to capture people's religious sense. They fabricate the lie so that it will, Im it will correspond to people's need. What you've got in... <coughs> in the middle, in mid-20th century Europe, is a lot of godless people. You know, you've got, I mean, Jesus Christ is God. So when you kick Jesus Christ out, you've got a big vacuum. When people turn, when, we, when people drop Christ, and they drop Christianity, and they drop the Catholic Church, and they even drop Protestantism, you, you leave a big vacuum. Mm. And then something big has to come into that vacuum, and the Jews, so to speak, know how to fill that vacuum. Yeah. So people want to believe in what I call the, the vision of ghastly horror. And um, I feel this is a bit connected with um, the instance of depression 
but it's now the most common cause of people getting time off work. It's overtaking yes. back pain. Yes. People say they're too depressed to come into work. Yes. And really that's I not surprising. If, if no, this I is agree. This, I agree uh, completely. If, if you have this terrific central vision of, of horror, uh, which is, it seems to me, the very foundation of modern nihilism in the 20th century. The, the very basis of, of nihilism was this idea that six million Jews were killed by the Germans for no particular reason. I, I, I'm not sure. I think the six million is the product of the nihilism rather than the, 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 the producer. Or the, it's, it's, it's egg and he, hen and egg, hen, chicken and egg, chicken and egg. Which came first, you know, chicken or the egg. But nihilism has, a, has been around for quite a while. And nihilism, had, had if, if, you know, the belief in nothing, nihil in Latin is nothing, the belief in nothing had been around for quite a while before the Second World War, at least amongst the Le the uh, the leading elites, the intellectuals, the supposed elites of society, a lot of nihilism, a lot of, you know, I mean, for instance, T.S. Eliot wrote his famous uh, Wasteland poem in 1922. It was, and it's a it's a great piece about the, it's a marvelous portrait of the literally w spiritual wasteland of modern civilization, because people have no religion, and then along came this, and and I say that. The, the people who created this myth knew what they were doing. They knew what people needed. They knew what people would respond to. As you say, it, 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 it's a substitute redemption. It's a substitute guilt. It's, substitute, it's, 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 it's everything. Substitute sacrifice, substitute redemption, mm. substitute God. And you don't need to believe in anything. You don't need to believe in any God. You don't need to believe in heaven and hell. All you need to believe in is the Second World War. Well, everybody believes in the Second World War. And in the wickedness, you have to believe there were Nazis. Everybody believes in Nazis. Then you have to believe in the wickedness of the Nazis. And, oh, that's, uh, and, and then you have to believe the absolute wickedness. The whole the thing, the lie is climbing, is, is mounting up. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's parasiting on some truth. Mounting up. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's parasiting on some truth. Okay, um, if you may just comment generally upon this uh, angled question of, uh, of, of the use of a demonised enemy image to disempower people in, in, in our society. Um, it seems to me this is something that happens in British culture very strongly. Sixty years ago it was the Nazis, then it was the communists, and now it's Muslim terrorists, that, that we have to be given a fear image. Yeah. And it seems to me the Christian teaching of charity towards our neighbour should somehow... Uh, involve not just damning people as terrorists or, or, or whatever and should involve be a kind of command that you have to look at the other person's point of view. I mean, it seems to me, people say, oh, are you some kind of Nazi? Uh, and, uh, or no, are you a Holocaust denier? Or are you an anti-Semite? And those are actually three synonyms, one synonym. Yeah. Synonyms. Uh, and I say I'm a revisionist. And revisionism is the attempt to get a fair and balanced look at World War II. Yes, I know. And the original is based on the words of Jesus Christ about the beam and the moat, not to criticise the moats in your brother's eye when you haven't noticed the beam in your own eye. Yeah. What can one say? I said, you, you, I think only... <coughs> you, you can't... Uh, you can't understand the Antichrist unless you understand and believe in Christ. The, the stakes are enormous. The stakes are the eternal salvation or damnation of billions and billions of souls. And uh, our Lord knows that and Satan knows that. Satan is playing for the, to get as every single one, if he possibly can, to get every single one of these souls into hell. Our Lord is playing to get as many as possible of these souls into heaven. And it's, it's our free will. We are human beings with free will caught in between. Um, our Lord founded his church to save souls. Uh, and in, but Satan is obviously then a bitter enemy of the Catholic Church. And uh, in recent times he succeeded in making even the Catholic Churchmen accept this false view of history and false view of the and modern to give world. give us a clue about Satan, would it be the power that is able to create money out of nothing, the, the fiat currency which private, we, we, our society, our civilization gives to private cartels, the ability to, to uh, 
manufacture money for, for a government that's, and then charge interest to if the I'm, If I may yeah. so say, that's peanuts as far as Satan is concerned. He's in, that, that's undoubtedly an offspin of his, yes. The, the falsification of money, if you like. But the falsification of you know, doctrine, of, of saving doctrine, is, is much more grave. But I, I, the, the false economics is a spin-off. Economics is tertiary. Politics is secondary. Religion is primary. Religion governs politics, ultimately, and politics governs economics. And so religion governing politics, you can see how the drive for to get rid of the true religion, to replace the true religion with a false religion, is what's governed all of these pol politics and all of these lies of the, of the, of the, of the New World Order. Mm. The, the, the politics of the New World Order is following a religious drive to make lies prevail to such an extent that every single soul will fall into hell for all eternity. Yeah, it seems to me that, that following <coughs> the Nine Amendment, closely following it, was a, 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 a political reformulation of you know, for us or against us and yes. life against darkness and the evil yes. wicked terrorists were out there that's and it. that became the ratification for that's invading it. other, other that's nations. It. That's it. Whereas actually the people saying this were those who had more or less uh, constructed and dreamed up the event in the first place. I, I have to agree. I have to agree and uh, if you know I, I think this is the church's business but it's nevertheless necessary to be prudent. You can't the 15-year-old the, the girl can't go up and slap the emperor in the face because he's full of devils. It might be just, but he, she can't do it. If he challenges her, then she's got to give a, a truthful answer, but she hasn't got to challenge him. And Christians are not bound to challenge this, this, world, this satanic world power, which is in power at present and, and is very wicked, and which has has succeeded in infiltrating even the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church broadly resisted until the 1950s. But um, it's, it's noticeable that the, this myth, the, uh, what I might call the six million myth, took off only after Vatican II. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it was established at Nuremberg, but during the 50s it didn't really bite yet. No, no. It's only after the 60s that it really got going. Yeah. And that's because the, the, the guardian of truth, the bullock against lies, had to be infiltrated and collapsed before the lies could really get going. And that was Vatican II. Uh, up to point, yeah. But also let's remember that uh, there was the phrase the nuclear holocaust that we were all frightened of. Okay? That was a kind yeah. of apocalypse. It was a transcendental meaning which politicians could have just by having a button at their fingertip. Uh, and that was actually a correct meaning of the word holocaust, as fiery sacrifice. Okay? Mm. Now, that was, gave a kind of ultimate dimension to politics and kept everyone listening to these otherwise quite worthless politicians in case they wanted to press the button, okay? Mm. Now, when that faded out around the end of the 80s, uh, our politicians needed another, as it were, grand story. Yes. And the word Holocaust then metamorphosed more into its terrible, intense meaning it has now. I understand. So what you're saying everybody, is... Everybody, if you yes. put the definite article in front of the word Holocaust, <coughs> everybody knows that what you're talking about is much well, more Well, maybe we can distinguish three stages. Stage one, the Nuremberg trials. Stage two, the 1970s. And stage three, the 1990s. In any case, it's, it's taken over people's hearts and souls and minds, yes. And it's... Um, and it insulates Zion against all accusations of iniquity. That's correct. That's correct. They're entitled, they have all rights because they suffered from the Holocaust. That's how, that's how they, it's used. It's unbelievable, but it, there it is. It's a reality. Mm. Um, well, uh, I'd like to express the hope, Bishop, that you'll be allowed to uh, preach in an Eng English church. Um, I think people <laughs> would much appreciate hearing your words uh, and hearing, especially, I can't really hardly think of any other bishop who's written four volumes of lively and interesting letters to, his, uh, uh, to, the, to the people. Um, l let me quote a nice quote of yours about how the Mass works. Um, uh, a Catholic seminary without the true Tridentine Mass is like an atomic reactor without the uranium. Um, that, uh, that you feel there's something that really works when a mass is done properly, some sort yes. of real authentic power. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, that's, May that's Archbishop Lefebvre, basically. Uh -huh. It's Archbishop Lefebvre who said that he, he used to say that if, <clears throat> if he had to, on, according to the orders of Pope Paul VI, put the new mass into his seminaries, 
he might as well put the key in the door. In other words, he had to shut the whole thing down. That's what he said. The Archbishop was a great believer in the Catholic Mass. The Catholic Mass is, is the, re, the making present again of the sacrifice of Calvary, which is the redemption of all of us, and without which we are all of us hopeless victims of Satan. Mm -hmm. So you've received instructions from this uh, uh, Frenchman, F F Fevenot, Secretary of the Society, not only that you're not allowed to speak, but you're not even allowed to have your private members only web blog up, on, up available. Uh, uh, and yes. He's you that media saying he told you to shut up for real. Well, this sounds a lot more like instructions from the Holy Sanhedrin than from uh, some sort of uh, professors of the, of the Church of Jesus. You're, you're, you're accusing my, my superiors. <laughs> That's, as I say, they see. Um, they see me as being too liable to open my mouth on subjects which are not directly religious. This is how they see it. On subjects which are not directly religious and on subjects which, moreover, are liable to cause all kinds of unnecessary problems to the society. That's how they see it. Yes. And therefore they want to, to, to muzzle me, which yes. is completely understandable. Now, you have taken an absolute vow of obedience as a priest. No, it's not actually an absolute vow. It's, it's, it's not that heavy. It's a promise of obedience. If, but if I don't, if I choose not to follow that promise in something important, well, they may have to ease me out of the society. Um, I'm sure it's convenient for the Catholic hierarchy to have bishops making this promise of obedience to do what they're told, but that wasn't the teaching of Jesus Christ at all, was it? He never told his disciples to obey, obey anybody. Um, that's not quite right. Uh, he, he himself gave a tremendous example of obedience. Uh, but not the, to any human source. Uh, that's correct. But it was to a d divine source which was telling him to undergo the most horrible death and execution, the most horrible suffering and death. He obeyed. He said, I don't, I, thy, Father, thy will and not my will be done. He didn't want to obey. He broke out in a sweat of blood at the thought of what the horror he was going to have to go through. It, it, it was an absolute agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was total agony. But he obeyed. So, you know, that's an example which speaks louder than a lot of words. But, and uh, obedience is, is central to Catholicism. Another example from our Lord. I mean, he, he spent 30 years in, uh, in Nazareth as a little child, or in Egypt and in Nazareth, uh, obeying two human beings, only, only obeying his, his mother. Well, and I thought he showed his disciples about uh, breaking the law on the Sabbath and uh, picking the stuff. Uh, that he was yes. To. And then it, he said man was made. Man the Sabbath was, was made Sabbath. for man and not man for the Sabbath. Yeah. That's true. In other words, that's a, a law of a particular kind that's not uh, absolute in all. It's, it's, it's what's called a positive law, rather, and therefore, in circumstance, particular circumstances, like the apostles starving. It, it's, it's reasonable to break it. It's common sense to break it. I mean, my, my wife is pregnant. She's about to give birth. I race to the hospital. There's only one sparking parking space. It says, don't park. I'm going to park there because she's screaming in agony, whatever it is. It's common sense. I'm going to break the, I'm going to break the little regulation for a greater good, yes. But the greater regulations I can't break at, a, at any time. So their absolute, obedience must be absolute. Well, it seems to me uh, you're one of the only four bishops of this SSPX that yes. have the, the true Catholic faith. It seems to me that uh, <coughs> perhaps after letting a little bit of time going past and having some very serious and thorough discussions of the matter with you, that they really need to uh, let you preach again in a, in a, in a church in, <laughs> in England. If you were my superior, I know. But if you were my superior, I'd be saying everything I wanted and I'd be in prison before I could say blink. Even in England, I think I'd be in prison. Well, a colleague of mine was saying that if you had webcasts of your sermons, you'd get 50 or 100,000 people watching them. I, I mean, don't think to, you would. You've got to understand that people around the world are really concerned and interested in, in what you've got to say. And I think you've got a uh, pastoral duty of guidance. I don't think you'd find they're that interested. If, you've, if they... If they <clears throat> if, when well, the moment they realise that, you know, there's truth involved, and the truth includes the Ten Commandments, and that if I'm going to obey, keep the Ten Commandments, I'm going to have to change my style of life. That's a, that's the moment at which people.
people they may be very interested in being told that there are great there are some great lies circulating and things they believe are not true but if you, if they then move on to having to change their style of life that's a, as americans say a different ball of wax i think you'll find many less people interested then it's, they'd have to as the old the old fashioned word is convert they'd have to change their ways just stop moving away from god and start moving towards god and not many people are willing to do that i don't think it's more demanding. As long as there are no demands, well, it's all very interesting and exciting and new and, and I can blame everybody else. But when I start realizing that I've got to blame myself, I'm going to, I've got to clean up my act. I'm not going to clean up everybody else's act. I love hearing about other people's sins. But when I realize that I'm going to have to start thinking about my own sins, no. then the shoe begins to pinch. Yeah, okay. Well, finally, um, let me finish with it. Uh, um, if you don't want to talk about this, that, that's fine, a bit touchy, but uh, in your book, we talk yeah. about the, the, the clarity of doctrine you have in SDX and how you get dumbed down Catholic priests in the Roman Catholic Church, and this can lead to uh, uh, substitute person satisfactions, which will include the uh, include the, the scandals that are now yes, living in the Roman true. Catholic Church. Yes. Would it be correct to say that uh, the SSPX has not been contaminated by this scandal? I'd love to say that, uh, but uh, SSPX, SSPX priests are human, and therefore, you, wherever you get human beings, you're going to get human failings. And priests remain human. They're not, they're, they aren't given by our Lord when they become a priest. They're not given a guarantee against any, any further sins. They're given a great deal of help not to sin. They're given special help not to sin. But they also get come under special pressure from the devil pushing them to sin. Because if the devil can get a priest to sin, then that's going to make it much easier for a lot of other people as well to sin. So priests can priests remain human. And wherever you've got human priests, you're going to get these failings. So I think, I mean, in all honesty, there have been cases inside the society of this kind. I don't think they've been any like as frequent as, as outside because the priests in the society have the true mass, which is the purpose of the priest. The priest has his main purpose is still with him. But um, I just wonder, if, excuse me saying, uh, Jesus didn't instruct his disciples to practice uh, uh, chastity. Um, yes. Peter, Peter, the main disciple, ha had a wife, didn't he? Yes. Um, so isn't this something that the <coughs> church has, I mean, the story is that the church uh, demanded, uh, demanded absence so that uh, they could inherit all the lands of, of the... Uh, oh. Of the, of the of the priests, so I don't know whether it's no 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 no? I don't, no that's not true, no. But but isn't isn't it a, <laughs> surely the teaching of chastity does not come from Jesus Christ, does it? The example comes from our Lord, obviously. I mean, our Lord was perfectly and absolutely chaste. Well, that was a difficult thing. If he was going through death and resurrection, that that was a totally special life. Uh, and, uh, but he didn't request it of his disciples. Uh, I I don't know i i can't tell you exactly i don't think it was uh, the, the 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 requirement of complete chastity was not immediate in the catholic church for instance um st p st paul writes in in scripture that a bishop must have only one wife um so the chastity is not immediate but it becomes it is it's established in the first few centuries it becomes a practice in the first few centuries and then the Greek or the Greek Orthodox Church, still bishops are not allowed to have wives. Bishops must be celibate. The priests may have a wife, but not the, not the bishops in the Greek Orthodox Church. Right. So that's a kind of that's a kind of a balance, isn't it? Of saying uh, bishops it's, but not priests. If you like, it's a kind of balance. Yeah, in that yeah. respect, it's a balance. Um, generally speaking, shouldn't a choice of chastity be a very very personal one, which does not depend on on finance? If you're going to take a job being a a, a priest, that, that job perhaps which involves being paid, perhaps that should not involve that, such a difficult commitment. As celibacy. It's not difficult if you keep, make, observe certain elementary precautions. You've got to observe the precautions. And with the grace of God, it's, with the grace of God, it's possible. It's not that impossible. So the problem is not celibacy. Um, that the problem is, let me give you a little example. <coughs> You've got a harbour 
with uh, high tide and low tide. Now, at low tide, rocks, certain rocks, come very dangerously close to the surface. So at low tide, if you're rowing out of the harbour, you've got to really watch out. But at high tide, you don't have to bother because you're way above the rocks. Now, if a priest has his life full of priestliness, that's like high tide and the rocks, which are always the same. The rocks are always the same. The same temptation. They're always there. The rocks are no danger if your priestly life is full of priestliness. But if your priestly life is dropping, then the rocks become dangerous. And that's, that's, you know, that's why the, we've got so many cases of pedophilia, because the, ever since Vatican II, the priests' lives have been much less priestly. They've had much less of the true, true faith and the true practice of the priesthood in their lives. <clears throat>